I'm Saliha Ali and I'm delighted to be here at the home of Norman Lewis to find out what he thinks our prospects are in terms of unemployment, jobs, low wages and the economy. Who do you think is to blame for the lack of jobs and the levels of, of unemployment? What would you say are the key causes? I think the fundamental problem is the reason why we have um, rising unemployment and indeed why we have what appears to be a real lack of opportunity, particularly for younger people, mm -hmm. is that we're an economy that's very much kind of living off its past, either st stagnant in terms of, of productive investment in new industries or whatever, or, you know, financialization, which is essentially, you know, using, uh, living off other people's money where, where jobs are being created elsewhere in the world and we're just kind of creaming off the financial effluent. Mm -hmm. if you want to put it that way. And now this is not a new trend. You know, this is a trend that goes back um, you know, at least a, a hundred years or so. Even at the time that Karl Marx was writing, um, Capital, he was already identifying Britain as a parasitic society where it was living off the productive activities of other countries. We have not invested in you know, where it really counts, which is in creating new industries in productive investment, not just financial speculation, right. kind of what people are referring to as casino capitalism and all mm -hmm. of that. If there's any blame to be had here, there seems to be no ability of the political or cultural elite to really face up to what, what are the very difficult questions that have to be resolved. Now, when, when you say one of the problems is lack of productive investment, what, can you elaborate on that a little bit? What do you mean by that? Um, if you want people to do jobs that are really worth something, that are going to be fulfilling in some respect, then you really have to you know, create uh, spheres of, of, of industry that you know, capture people's imaginations, that they can you know, really apply themselves and see that they have careers in, that there's a kind of real aspiration to not just simply turn up and you know, put on a, a crappy uniform and, and serve burgers you know, or, or, or serve in a shop. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, m some people might like doing that. I'm not you know, uh, stigmatizing that at all. But let me give you an example. If, if you go back to the post-war period in America when uh, Kennedy announced that uh, the US was going to go to the moon. Right. Now, if you think back about that, I mean, there were a number of things that were fantastic about that. Um, Okay, forget about the Cold War and the, the context and all of that. I think you know that that's obviously very important. Yeah. But the critical thing was that you know here you got a leader who got up and said, in his in the words were, um, you know, we're going to the moon not because it's easy but because it's difficult. What's fantastic about that is that this is a vision that everybody could get behind, and not only that, as a consequence of that, you had the development of whole new areas of industry. So if you look at the the impact that it had on on the medical. Uh, on the impact that it had on the development of new materials and, and design, on, on computing and microprocessing and all of that. Everything that we are kind of like, you know, we think is so wonderful about today was actually a consequence of that real drive that occurred then. Yeah. And that, so you had a massive amount of investment that took place and huge spin-offs. It, it cut across the whole of society. That's the point. So, so the solution to this is not, can we find an industry that we can put some money into? Right. What we're really talking about is that this is, is a holistic, has to be seen as a holistic problem. You need kind of reinforcing innovations and development of knowledge that, that has this overall social impact. So back down to earth, um, Michael Portillo recently said that the idle young should be entitled to nothing. What do you think about that? I think work is fundamental to you know, being a part of society, and particularly for young people, to um, gain a sense of, of, of personhood, of independence. And I'm not su suggesting that I would support schemes that you know, make young people work for, for peanuts, you know, mm. kind of slavery. But certainly I think uh, it's very fundamental that young people um, grow up in a society where it's expected that they should productively participate in, 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 in society. Yeah, it's absolutely critical. So from from that point of view, you know, I think he's right. But do you think that, for example, unemployment benefits should be used to push people into jobs, for example, that don't meet their material aspirations and, and you know, don't meet their career ambitions? Yeah, you know, I have a problem with, uh, with anything that um, involves the kind of state regulation of social behaviour. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think young people should, should, the expectation should be that they should be working, but they should be earning a decent wage. 
but you know i mean obviously there's there, there's always going to be a gap between um what people's aspirations might be and what they might have to do to get there at the moment unemployment stands at least two and a half million and amongst 18 to 24 year olds it's you know about a third are on benefits why do you think there haven't been any major protests on the streets about unemployment that's a good question i i, I would in fact question your figures I'm, I'm sure it's a lot higher okay i think on the one hand you have this kind of naturalization of the market right you people just accept now that because at the end of the cold war because the end of ideological conflict between capitalism socialism or communism or whatever mm -hmm. everybody accepts in the words of margaret thatcher that there's no alternative and right. um, and therefore if there's no alternative then the market is like is is, is as natural as the birds and the bees and the trees and and there's not much you can do about them except you know plant and follow the cycles of the of of, of the seasons mm -hmm. i think on the other we have the kind of what i would call the kind of depoliticization of society where people have become individuated where we don't the notions of social solidarity and all of that you know we we don't have the old forms that we used to have that might have been around trade unions or political parties or whatever today it's you know it's around victimhood and uh, and special dispensation for this and that and uh, the problem there is that as a consequence people are not do not look at each other for strength or for some, f f looking for solutions they're looking for outside parties to kind of solve this so you know unemployment you accept us like we accept volcanic ash but then what would you say about the protests in Greece I mean they're out on the streets giving it some what would you say about that compared perhaps to the way things have been people are a little bit shocked and sitting up and thinking oh my god but when you look at the numbers who are on the streets mm -hmm. um, uh, of Athens mm -hmm. it was not very significant it was like 50,000 people yeah. You know, so that same individuation, that same kind of lack of, of solidarity, I think, still is, you know, is, is definitely the case across the whole of the Western world. But so then, do you think that unemployment can ever be a politicising issue then? Again, I think it depends on the context. I mean, if you take the unions, for example, you know, trade unions were not set up to defend the unemployed. They were there to defend the employed. In fact, more often than not, it's about keeping, you know, protecting the employed from the unemployed. Because, as you well know, you know the way capitalism has always used the unemployed as is a way of of, of driving down wages, etc., yeah. which is how they've used migrant workers, and uh, um, you know that the whole question of, of of immigration has been very consciously used um, to bring people in that are prepared to do things uh, at a lower wage that uh, perhaps indigenous people are not prepared to do, and so you know it's a way of dividing the working class and and, and, and all of that. So, unemployment. I think can become uh, a, a mobilizing issue, but mm -hmm. only in the context of a, where you have a political movement which you know, is able to unite people, not around employment, not as engineers or, or, or McDonald's workers, but as people who have you know, the same position in society and have the same interests, it's around their interests as members of, of, of a society rather than skills or, or, or jobs. So I think unemployment is always going to be too narrow a field to, to create the kind of political movement that can unify. Just on the issue of driving down wages, mm. some argue that the UK job market suffers as a result of global competition. The point is that you know, capitalism has always been a global system and that's always been the case. This is nothing particularly new capital goes where it'll find the greatest return on its investment and capital movements are always behind the kind of shifts that occur if you go through the last the 20th century uh, the whole shift from the decline of the British Empire to the rise of the American Empire to the decline of America today relatively uh, the rise of China or Japan or, or, or whatever these are, are this is the way that capitalism works and it does obviously impact on national economies. You know, the recent financial crisis is a very good example of what really goes on because it's not the world banks that's, you know, bailed out Goldman Sachs or bailed out the Royal Bank of Scotland or, or First Direct or, or uh, um, you know, all the British banks that got into it. It's the British state. British state protects British banks. You know, American state, the Fed, 
protected American banks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this notion that, that somewhere in this, this globalised world where there's, the nation state is no longer important and therefore you can't really be held responsible as a political leader in Britain for the fact that there are some jobs have gone to China or to India, you know, outsourcing of call centres or, or whatever. And it's just, a, it's just another form of, of this, this evasion of, of responsibility and of leadership and of vision. Uh, to sort things out here and to and to you know tackle the the difficult problems. Okay, but then what what do you think about you know the whole British jobs for British workers and the more recent thing where um, they're trying to bring in something where migrants, for example, with the regionalism where you know they they'll only be allowed to work in certain industries in certain parts of the country. What this do you is, think about that? This is where I have to say that I just totally disagree with Nick. Um, you know, this, this liberal idea, I mean, it's fantastic. This, uh, the most illiberal, you know, lib liberal party in the world. Yeah. They're really talking about, you know, bringing people in and basically putting them in concentration camps in, in the Midlands because that's where there might be some jobs for them. I mean, it's just absolutely outrageous, yeah. really. It's just completely unacceptable. The notion of British jobs for British workers, you know, um, can only be the, the, the battle cry of, of the British employers and, and the embattled kind of British middle class. It's not something that, that in, in, at the end of the day is in the interests of any British worker. And in fact, indeed, if you look at some of these recent things where there's been these discuss discussions, that really was not what they were arguing for. This is what the politicians kind of interpreted it as. And because they understand, and that's why you had there are historical examples of where British workers, you know, supported cotton workers in America, where there was solidarity with workers who were in, in, in other parts of the world. Because at the end of the day, you know, if you understand that the only thing you have in life is your ability to work for somebody who has got money, you have got more in common with other people like that anywhere in the world than you have with the people that employ you. And, and that's always been the, the, the case. And, and of course, politically, um, they've always attempted to try and disguise that, that common interest and try to say that there's a common interest between you and your employer in Britain, which is what British nationalism was really all about. It was about you know, making people feel that they were part of this, this, this nation. Because in reality, you know, they were just there to, to, to create surplus value, mm -hmm. to create profit for, 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 for British bosses. And they really didn't have much interest in, in, in that at all, apart from the fact that we occupied the same land space. Yeah. So I think that, um, again, that has become a very different meaning today because you don't have that political movement anymore. Okay, so you've recently written a manifesto on innovation. So what do you think is the role of innovation in relation to economic recovery, creating a more dynamic economy, and in, also in terms of jobs? I think that's the key to getting us out of this mess that we're in. I think what we really need to do is we need to return back to kind of good old basic research and development, going back to science, being willing to undertake research where we don't know what the outcomes will be because we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're not sure that this research is going to be applicable or being able to be applied tomorrow. But who knows that what research we do today might not, not become critical you know, in 20, 30 years' time. If we were able to unpack some new areas of, of energy research or renewable re energies, you know, that, that could provide enormous potential investment, whole new areas of, of knowledge and therefore education mm -hmm. and therefore new skills and creations of, of new industries around us. And, and you know, that's what I think young people in particular you know, should be, that's what they should be aspiring to, not about um, you know, should we get involved in some kind of green bullshit deal that's basically going to take young people, being, paying them very little, going around insulating people's homes, you know, which is what, 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 what a lot of what uh, Obama's Green Deal is. You know, this kind of, uh, you know, what is that? That's kind of, to me, that's kind of demeaning young people. It's kind of telling them that, you know, anything you can do is go around with a piece of tape and, you know, and then tell people to switch their lights off. Um, I think we've got to have much more ambition mm -hmm. and understand that, um, you know, there, 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 there are such big problems that we are facing that we're only going to solve them by really investing in the most important capital that we have, which is us, people. Um, so for me, you know, an, another billion people 
coming into the world in India or China and being on, online and all that is, is an opportunity. It's not a problem. It's not about there's too many people in the world. That's another billion brains mm. that can be applied to solve real problems that we have in society. So that's the kind of what our manifesto is really about. It's about that aspiration. But in terms of the Green New Deal, what do you think about the idea of sustainable economic growth going into the future? It's such a narrow, short-termist view of society because, you know, what we, the way we build a house today, maybe in 50 years' time, we'll find much better ways of doing it. So why, why would we have been thinking that this house is now sustainable, we can keep this for the next 500 years, mm -hmm. when there will be new technologies, new techniques, new knowledge, new science that will come along and we will you know, be able to completely revolutionize the way we build houses. Uh, is, this, uh, is this sustainable? When you, by the very nature of asking that question of sustainability, you are limiting where that can go mm -hmm. in the future. And that's a culture of limits. And it's the opposite of an innovation culture. Again, get, go back to innovation. Mm -hmm. um, an innovation culture is really about one that, you know, you don't know all the answers and you are comfortable with that. You know, it's like Einstein said, you know, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research. Uh, there's nothing wrong with trying to use the resources that you have productively mm. and effectively and, and efficiently. I've got no problem with that. But that's not the same thing. What about cuts, public spending cuts? Everyone's talking about it to reduce the budget deficit. Should we accept cuts and, you know, austerity measures? The problem is here is the political context within which mm -hmm. this happens and who, who determines uh, who's going to, you know, whose job should be cut and who shouldn't mm -hmm. and then what effect that has on, on people's lives. Mm -hmm. You see, now I'd be prepared to accept certain kinds of cuts if I knew that the political leadership in this mm -hmm. country or the political parties were going to, you know, as a consequence of this, create something that was productive. But, you know, given their record and given their complete abject you know, cowardice, I wouldn't trust them for a second. And, 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 and giving them the right to, to make these cuts and everything, you know, fills me with dread. Uh, it really does, because I, I don't think it's going to solve the problems. Then what jobs do you think people could be doing and how would this come about? I have a, a, a big problem with, um, particularly when I speak to people about younger people and, and employment prospects for the future because, I mean, I, I, I really do think that um, the education system that we've got uh, is really letting young people down. We've basically been praising the kids. We kind of, we've, what I'd call the kind of, we've infantilized society. Especially if, you, if I look at this discussion around young people and digital technologies mm -hmm. uh, and why they adopt these technologies, we, 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 we're so flattering of young people that we think, you know, oh, it's just wonderful the way young people can pick up technology and use a mobile phone in the way that they do. It's just, isn't it wonderful? And my, mm -hmm. my Samantha is so smart because she can, you know, program a DVD on, on and she's, she's only three years old. Which is just complete bullshit. It's it's you know children are not naturally good with technology, right? They they have got no inhibitions about using it. Because they don't know the value of anything, so they just play with it and they mm -hmm. get cause and effect. You know, you could program a monkey to to to, to program a, a DVD. My problem with young people and jobs and everything is that we've been so flattering of young people. I and mean, what we should have been doing is instead of going trying to get down with the kids and become their friends and you know we are. We're like you, and we want to be. We, we want to learn from you, and all this. What, you know, what, what young people are going to teach me? I've got no idea. Um, but is to say to them, you know, it's just kind of take them by the scruff of the neck and say, look, it's not good enough playing with technology. You must, you know, you really want to do is inspire them about the technology behind the technology, about the science, the physics, the mathematics. The, you know, really get them geared up for that, so that that fires their imaginations that creates that drive for more knowledge, for more expertise, to go beyond what they already know. Um, and that's what we will create citizens of the future, that, that, that will be able to get us out of this mess. It's said that you know, capitalism needs unemployment, or what's called as a reserve army of labor. So from that point of view, do you think that full employment is ever possible? I think you can have fuller employment. If you compare say China today, mm -hmm. to, to a lot of the West. Um, now China has massive unemployment. I think one of the figures I saw was something like 30 million 
Yeah, I mean, just the reserve army of unemployed wandering around China looking for jobs is huge. It's bigger than the labor markets here, just the unemployed. But in China, the aspiration, the, the kind of attitude of people is that, you know, things are going get, to are gonna, are getting better, are better, are going to be even better in the future, that their, their future is a very optimistic one. They're very future oriented. I don't think capitalism can ever operate at full employment. But there is a difference between a capitalist society that is going forward and is future oriented as opposed to one that's stagnant and is kind of living off its past. I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that even in, a, in China you will still find there will be people who will be quite happy to kind of live off ben benefits mm -hmm. or, or whatever. You're always going to get that differentiation within, but that's not the dominant view at all. Yeah. Those would really be regarded as the kind of outsiders or the, the kind of loss, the losers. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, I'd say in Britain, you know, being a loser is kind of quite acceptable now. In fact, uh, if anything, you can claim victim status and um, you know, gain some resources from the state. What about inequality? Uh, a lot of people might say that uh, footballers are earning millions while street cleaners are on peanuts and that that's quite problematic. What, what do you think about that? Well, I've got, obviously, that's an inherent problem with, uh, with, with capitalism. If you grow up in a, in a, in a family that you know, owns a lot of capital, that owns a lot of property or whatever, you know, your, your opportunities in life are going to be much greater than those that don't mm -hmm. grow up on a council estate. Inequality um, is, is, is a fact of life, of, of a social system that is based upon unequal um, access to resources. But you also always got to define inequality as always going to be relative as well. Mm. You know, you can, you could be living in a in a council estate, which is you know pretty good, at well constructed. Mm -hmm. You could be eating well. You could you know you could even have a car. Mm. You could even be able to go on holidays. But you're still going to be there's still a gap between you and uh, uh, <coughs> and the wealthiest people in in society. There's mm. so that relative gap between you, you could still talk about inequality. Mm -hmm. What you might be talking about, perhaps in your question, is more about people that are kind of living below the poverty day to right, line, yeah. uh, or whatever, people that are really struggling to, to, to make ends meet, whilst, you know, other people are, are you know, that, 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 again, I think can only be addressed um, politically. What you're not advocating is redistribution in the sense of that the rich, for example, with the bankers, it's become quite clear, you know, that they should have less money in order for other people um, to have a chance for, uh, you know, more material wealth. And so take from the rich and give it to the poor, I suppose. Is, is that... Well, yeah, I, I think that that's um, you know, it's nice fairy, it fairy, fairy tale story stuff, you know, it's kind of... Um, these, these greedy bankers, you know, it's, um, it, they should give back something, or they should have less. They should, you know, they should instead of having two yachts, they should only have one. I mean, come on, this is just Mickey Mouse, child, childish politics. You know, the real question is, why should they have it in the first place? Why should we have a society that is based upon that in the in the first instance? Uh, and of course, you know, uh, anybody who's listening to this who who um, you know, is 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 pro market blah 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 will, will say that this is the, the most effective way of creating wealth, uh, uh, etc. Where you know I, I I could rehearse some old arguments about you know, uh, how inefficient this system really is that that we waste an enormous amount um, that if we consciously um, innovated and planned society in a way that we had more control over all of this, um, we could create more wealth and that wealth could be distributed much, much more equitably, mm -hmm. equitably and therefore we could get more out of people because they wouldn't be spending you know, 18 hours a day just scrabbling to, 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 to survive, mm -hmm. uh, but we could unleash the real creative capacity of, that's inherent in all human beings. Um, you know, that, that ultimately is I think in the future is where society will go. Yeah. Look at look at the recession that we're in, and if any anybody thinks that we're out of this recession, you know they're really deluding themselves because I think we're, we're in for a, a very rough ride. It's not a crisis that's going to be resolved through some you know nice 
touchy-feely, uh, well, we could distribute a little bit of money from here to there, or whatever. This is systemic. This is an institutionalized problem. Uh, inequality and all of that is just one expression of, of, a, of a system that's fundamentally broken. Thank you, Norman. Well, there's a lot of food for thought in there. Do be sure to check out Norman's blog, which is futures-diagnosis.com and also his manifesto on innovation, which is bigpotatoes.org.